All right. All right, ready to go? I'm ready. <laughs> well, so actually, for some logistic issue, we probably have to change slides in between. But anyway, please excuse us. Um, so let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we were a team of three, now we're a team of two. So we're going to work through this and do it very quickly. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Sharice Maynard. I am the, um, one of the co-founders at Nostra Data Medical. I'm also the founder of AskSharice.Tech and the um, co-founder of Hit Like a Girl Pod. We um, focus on women in leadership in the health information technology sector. I sit on the board of Direct Trust that does the trust relationships for exchange of healthcare information. And I'm on the board of um, Sharp Index, which works on the issue of physician suicide and clinician burnout. I've been doing this for a very long time. I work with startups and established um, industry professionals, and I'm very happy to be here today. All right, thank you, Cherise. <laughs> a lot of boards. I don't have too many boards. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Zhang Li. I'm the founder and uh, the CEO of uh, VivaLink. And the company VivaLink, uh, it's LifeLink, and our tagline is the digital life to, digital link to the life. Um, actually, Mike, if you can help me to. So actually, um, my background is in from the technology side. Um, actually, I have a PhD in chemical engineering, unlike a lot of you are MDs. So I have a PhD in chemical engineering, and I work in high-tech industry for my first part of my career. So the company here I created mainly, we call it, we have a data platform to automate insights from real world RPM data. And then we have a full suite of different uh, biometric sensors. Some of them are made by VivaLink, and, but a lot of them are, are not made by VivaLink. Or we, so we have over 30 different sensors from uh, different partners. And then we can gather a lot of different uh, uh, biometric information. And then the, the platform not only getting the data from sensor, but also processing the data through our platform and providing a lot of insights. So actually today's topic, as you folks know that, is we're talking about the opportunities and obstacles in RPM and AI. So and as this slide just shows you what uh, our company is taking a, a step up this. So you know, as a lot of companies right now are focusing on virtual healthcare solutions, and we see actually there's a tremendous technical challenges to build a fundamental robust infrastructure to connect to the patient and physician, right? So you have to be very good at the operational aspects, but then in addition, you need to pick the right sensors and edge computing, cloud and AI algorithm, all this have to be implemented flawlessly and with all the regulatory currents in need to operate. So what we come in as a company, we say, okay, for a virtual healthcare company, you don't need to worry too much about the sensor and the cloud and algorithm infrastructures. Instead, VivaLink can offer all those capabilities for you so that you can focus on specific patient care or logistics so that at end, the whole solution can be much easier to implement, reduce your time to market, and then you can really also reduce the burden of the regulatory challenges. That's, that's the overall business model we have. So in my sector, in my business, I'm kind of the um, make it make sense girl. So a lot of times um, people find it difficult to understand why um, health IT and all these lovely innovative solutions we have um, don't actually work and why they don't work for patients, why they don't work for doctors and that type of thing. And that's the intersection where I work, medicine, um, patient advocacy, um, health IT, and um, regulatory compliance. So I always explain, one of the reasons why we see so much messiness and why things can't just go the way we all planned them in our head is because um, regulation and innovation rarely get along. Those two things don't marry each other and don't go along well. So we can build these lovely models and they're great and I always encourage people, the startups I work with, build to your heart's content. But regulation, has the three C's, and innovation has the three C's. However, their, two, their three C's are not alike. So from um, regulation, we have compliance, control, and cost. Those are their three C's. On the innovation side, we're kind of like the uh, flexible people. We are creativity, we are um, um, connectivity, and 
cash. Now, for those of you who are checking, cash and cost are not the same thing if you look in terms of point of view. Um, regulators need cost-saving measures for all of these things that we create, okay? But for those of us who create and create these innovations um, that we want doctors to be comfortable using and patients to love, we want to make money at it. So it becomes a, a system where the two shall never meet. And that's where all that messiness comes from. Now, some of the models we see coming now, particularly for remote populations, hopefully are going to change some of that. One of the things that we learned from um, the pandemic, as horrible as the pandemic was, is that we can scale things quickly, right? But what it did also was create kind of a wild, wild west where um, a lot of um, builders, a lot of developers and vendors thought, oh, I can just bring this thing to market, they need it right now, and that um, type of mentality, which is true. However, what we also learned from the pandemic is that patients are the people and doctors are the pe people who actually use these things and have to make these things work for the way we live now and 10 years from now, not five years ago. So from the pandemic, we took those um, ideas and we're thinking, well, while we used to make it very hard for doctors to work with these models and patients very hard to work for these models, how do we want to look it to look in the future? The future should look more like, okay, we consider the patient first, the physician second, and then who's getting paid third. Traditionally, it's been the other way around for both sides of the thinking. So let's get into some of the um, AI solutions that you think could help and solve all those problems. What are you guys doing at your company? Um, so actually, one of the, when you talk about AI, one of the, I would say, the key challenge right now is not the lack of AI companies. There's a I lot of AI well. companies, mm -hmm. right? I would say is the, the lack of high quality data for the AI companies. Because um, you mean, to, in order to develop a highly, I would say, effective AI algorithm, you really need to feed in with a lot of high quality data. That's first. Second one is that then with high quality data also can really reduce the time and effort to develop those algorithms as well. So what we've been trying to do is uh, we make sure that our data source, like all the wearable devices, are uh, fully validated from our, ourselves. And then also, we, in our platform, we also do a lot of work to, for example, like reduce the noise and making sure all the data are flawlessly passed on to the cloud and then also organized into some very nice modern architecture like data lake structures so that people for AI development, they're much easier to use those data. Those, so yeah, that's what we see actually it's very important to support the advanced development for those AI companies. Okay, so right now I'm currently, um, we were talking earlier, I'm judging the Prime Health Challenge out in um, Colorado. And one of the, the problems I see with a lot of startups is they forget the data governance portion of it. So how are we managing all the, this data um, securely? What are your thoughts on it? So the data security, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I would say fortunately, there's a lot of uh, industry standards came out already, mm -hmm. like uh, privacy, GDPR, and then security, like uh, ISO 2701, uh, all these things really need to be implemented and followed. I think that's going to reduce a lot of heartburn right. <laughs> for people. Now, so, we did discuss yeah. that um, the, um, all the regulatory guidance that we're seeing with um, regard to data governance has its own challenges, which one of the gentlemen went over earlier. But I also like to remind people that one in five um, physician practices in this country still uses paper to clutch my pearls, but um, they still do. So it's not included in the rule, and it's still going to create those barriers. The other areas we see problems with the information blocking rules and research, those also have different um, rules for how this works, and they're also having trouble getting the information. Yeah, but well, one area I think you related to was the regulatory side, right? Mm -hmm. Especially the reimbursement part, I would say that's also obviously a big hidden mm -hmm. barrier, I would say, for the adoption of uh, RPM and AI. Yeah, the, the regulators um, want models to be disruptive, but as we've seen historically, we failed that test. We failed in that scope. So healthcare expenditures are still a large portion of our um, GDP. And while like use cases we've seen that can 
are able to lower um, the cost of care, we're not, right now that's not the environment we're in. We're in an environment now where we're still struggling to find out how to pay for all this innovation um, in a way that lessens burdens on physicians and that patients in all areas can adapt. So do you want to ask the audience, I mean, what obstacles they think will be for RPM or AI? I'm sure everybody has their own opinion. Are you guys familiar with um, AI uses in um, this sector, or do you have questions? Or your view of obstacles, right? Because yeah. we're talking about the obstacles yeah. for this, this area. I'm, I'm sure everybody has some opinion. Yes, please, Santi. Yeah, and I, I also, um, because I work on the issue of um, black maternal health, I always talk about the, um, the data and the data biases, the um, different issues we find there, and the integrity of um, data. So I find that a significant challenge. And I always say, you know, we have a lot of models, even some today that we're claiming to be um, health equity focused. And I always say, I warn companies, don't say your models um, a health equity focused model unless you, you're um, prepared to um, admit that the opposite exists, mm -hmm. right? So if you haven't done the studies on why people can't access care or why the data is bad, right, you shouldn't be selling it as a health equity model. So the um, data points and things we see around like the um, Ramy scores, um, that we know that those are challenges we have right now. However, we don't see the modeling for correcting those problems. It's just like, oh, we're a health equity model. Well, you didn't do this, so um, those are the current challenges. Yes, doctor. Yeah, we just, when we talked about that a little bit earlier, because, um, you know, our, our latest, um, you know, social determinant of health is um, digital equity. We know that. But you're right, the labeling's not there. And one thing that um, I always caution companies to do is, like, know where you're getting your data and um, who you're doing business with. And there's no standards for that right now. And I think some of that is because of the pandemic. Um, and I think we will see a shift in that also. I thought that was a good question for Steve, yeah. but I think he So, so I, I, I mean, just add a little bit of comment here is that in, in a very practical manner, I think right now, the healthcare system, they have to really see the relevance themselves and then try to judge by themselves, right? With the lack of the national or global standards on that. So that's probably the inevitable for this period. Of course, there's are people working on trying to set up standards, but then we don't want to wait Right? We'd rather certain healthcare systems start to implement it. Then we have the gro gro global standards coming up. It's like, 
I, I don't I think it's a reality right now. I want to think yes, but I'm going to say no. Um, trust is funny in healthcare, you know. I always say trust in healthcare depends on the, the organization who thinks they're creating it. So we have trust between systems, right? We can regulate it and create standards for it. Um, that's one thing. But I always say the most protected and um, studied on trust in healthcare should be between the doctor and the patient. So whatever we're doing should be making that communication between them uh, more efficient and effective and one that is protected. If someone does not trust your system or the means by which they access, or you work, you again, you failed in scope. And trust is a huge issue in healthcare. We don't like to admit it, but the distrust that's there was 100% earned, right? <laughs> it was earned. And two, you can't get trust by building one solution. You can't get trust by having a regulation. Trust is earned through communication and engagement. I trust my doctor and I trust the data he gives me, but not because I trust the system in which he operates. So a, a similar analogy here is uh, when you look at the actual medical device, even you get 510K clearance, mm -hmm. it does not mean you will be really accurate results, actually. You know, because our company, we make medical devices, we know, right? So it's like, it's almost become the minimum threshold to get FDA clearance. Then you really have to get the validation data, how well it performs in the real world, and then publish paper, then to get trust. So that's like, I, but I think to answer your question, I think it's one step to the right direction, but like to, what, to her point is that it's far from enough. Yeah. Yeah. Standards tell you what they want you to know, but not what you need to know, if that makes sense. Oh, this actually gets into a lot of areas, one of which is like um, incentive payments for those models and that type of thing. I always say the problem with those um, models, and I'm not against them, I think they're great, but as far as from a reimbursement standpoint, a regulatory standpoint is, you know, we say that you have to um, meet certain thresholds for it. Yeah, you meet them. But then we have to change the th threshold, right? So... I don't think it's a long-term um, solution to create um, those standards for those models. I think it's short-term, short-sighted for what we need now. But there has to be um, a different way we look at it. I'm the same way about virtual care. The, um, you know, virtual first care, in my opinion, serves a purpose to patients and um, doctors certainly, but as they are now, they're not ideal. So we have to find other ways to, you know, make these models work for everybody who uses the system and the reimbursement. So, you know, 
CMS didn't want to reimburse doctors at their proper rates for virtual care. Because what is the value? And that's what I was saying about um, your model. What is the value of that? How do we place value on that? Because the regulations originally were written, doctors have to see their patients face to face a certain amount of times within a certain amount of period. But what is the value of that to the patient? We now know that 70% of the population now are, hey, I'm all for virtual care and I'd like to use it for specialty appointments and that type of thing. However, regulation hasn't caught up to that. So um, again, I think it comes down to cost. I think doctors should be paid what they deserve. I don't think we pay them enough, quite frankly. Um, but from a regulatory standpoint, and because cost per patient, um, it gets into another one of those messy um, areas. What are your thoughts on that? No, I think it's, it's perfect, spot on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> are we okay doing on time? Do we actually end on time? Really? Wow. <laughs> Exceeding expectation. So. <laughs> I thought we were going over time. Um, where do you see the future of um, um, data in healthcare? Do you think we'll ever get it right with regulation? Well, so that's another big question. I, I, I feel. I mean, again, I have to relate to my model. I would say, so what we're trying to build here is that to, to enable a really trusted data platform for a lot of uh, healthcare service companies so that they don't need to take the burden mm -hmm. on by themselves, right? So that's at least one way for us to contribute to this ecosystem. And then, for sure, I want to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> the one thing I will say is that the... Um, the AI that I'm seeing is doing good things with removing bias from um, some of the data that we're using. And I really hope we see more um, resources put towards um, AI and healthcare. I wanted to make that clear because we need it. So, so one part of, I, I want another additional comment about AI is that uh, I think we, again, we all agree we're at like the very early stage mm -hmm. of the AI implementation in healthcare. So inevitably, at this stage, I can see it's probably a combination of AI algorithm plus some human intervention. Yeah. So just don't underestimate that. Now, this, the, the, I would say the infrastructure has to accommodate that kind of reality. AI plus some sort of uh, call center or some sort of human intervention to make that whole system work in this stage. Oh, I know. I wanted to ask you also, we were talking about um, rural areas and their lack of um, infrastructure and um, how we're able, and I was talking to you about some um, non-tech models or plug-and-play type of things. Right. What, how can AI function in a plug-and-play type of, um, can we get that done? Where we don't have to worry about rural pops having um, a lot of broadband and... Yeah, no, in my view, that's less about AI, but it's more about uh, uh, connectivity, mm -hmm. right? Edge connectivity. So it's about being able to properly collecting and passing the data onto the, the right AI engine, right. if you will. So there are definitely a, a lot of different uh, solutions are coming to the market or mm -hmm. already on the market, right? We're talking about plug and play, the wireless connectivity or other solutions. But that's definitely something, as I mean, earlier speaker were talking about 6G or 5G, and there's a mm -hmm. lot of technology in the plan. To I'm just wondering that. if, like, those um, type of wireless, maybe people don't get them yet, because I, I've seen where they're not getting funding. That will make the data transmission uh, requirement much, much less, to our point. Yeah, that's correct. And I think it's coming a lot quicker, but like I was, the point I was making that these models right now, um, 
um, VC is pulling away from those models. I don't, well, it's because of the common in me, but we need those models is what I'm saying. Um, and to the gentleman sitting next to you, he has um, a rural population, I believe he said, and he's doing these mobile health clinics and stuff. And we do need these solutions, particularly for women's health. So um, I would hope that there's a way to bring them to market faster, but I do see them like in competitions and stuff being not getting funded enough. Right? Not getting funded. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we need them. All right. Well, thank you all for thank your you attention guys. and hopefully give you some insights here. Mm -hmm. yeah.